So just to begin, I want to uh, make sure that you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into the, your profession so we can tell our, our clients and, and our audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you, Christopher. I, uh, I'm from Canada originally, from Toronto. And I moved down here in 78, drove my Volkswagen Rabbit down here with no AC. And having no AC in the state of Florida is not a good thing, I can assure you. <laughs> Especially when I drove down in uh, June when the torrential oh. rains had started. And I remember, like, I've never seen rain like this in my life. Uh, anyway, I moved down here, went to University of Miami. Uh, I graduated there, I did my master's there, and I taught at the School of Business. And I was at the U of M uh, at a time period when it was known as Quarterback U. I was in a class with Jim Kelly. Uh, I was in a class with Tester Verdi. Oh, wow. uh, Kelly used to sit beside me in a class, and uh, it was interesting to say the least. We were in a real estate class together. So uh, out of school, I started in the insurance business, the life insurance business. And probably about 10 years after I got started, I gravitated into the financial planning arena, became a certified financial planner, uh, became a CLU, which is Chartered Life Underwriter, Chartered uh, Financial Consultant. And we started working with three main groups, AT&T, Florida Power and Light, and the Florida Retirement System. School teachers, firefighters, police officers, people at Miami International Airport, etc. cetera. So that, that's kind of how I got started. That's amazing. Actually, uh, I, I was a grad assistant at UM uh, for Coach L's first two years uh, when he first came down for the basketball team. So it's all about the U, baby. I was there when Jimmy Johnson was, <laughs> was the coach of the Canes. That's awesome. So I have 10 questions that uh, we drew up to uh, kind of for you to elaborate uh, on these. And uh, the first one goes, how should I position my investment for 2023, given the economy may potentially be headed for a recession? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, negative talk about a potential recession in 2023. I'd rather focus on the positive rather than on the negative. And I wouldn't be concerned about what they coin may be a recession next year. First of all, I think you've got to find a certified financial planner somebody who listens to your needs and get a game plan together. Once you develop that game plan, and let, let's backtrack a minute, what do I mean by game plan? The game plan would include making sure your credit card debt is paid off, making sure you have money in the bank, in cash for emergency reserves, because unfortunately, most people in this country live paycheck to paycheck. They're working today to pay last month's bills, and that's not a good way to be. You want to have at least, I would say, three to six months of emergency reserves and savings. And then you want to develop a game plan where you meet with someone like myself and you figure out what your tolerance for risk is. How much arm twisting are you really willing to take? You then develop a strategy for investment commensurate with your risk tolerance. And so those investments would include small cap stocks, large cap stocks, uh, global stocks and bonds, etc. And you want to, in my opinion, invest and leave it alone, monitor and tweak it once a year, but don't play a game where you're trying to outpace or outguess what the market is going to do, because invariably you're going to guess wrong. And when you guess wrong, you're going to make mistakes. That's great. Second question I have for you is, I received a notice from AT&T about an interest rate increase. How will that affect my pension, and should I get out now? Well, so AT&T has a unique pension plan, as do a lot of companies, and that pension plan has kind of two parts to it. One is called a cash balance plan, which anyone that was hired after 1999 is part of, and the other part of the plan is called a pre-99 lump sum plan, and this is for craft or union employees. That pre-99 lump sum plan is not available to anyone that was hired after 2000. So it's only available to those folks that were hired prior to 2000, uh, Chris. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, that part of the plan was very interest rate sens sensitive. 
There was a letter sent to ATT employees about a month or so ago, back in November, saying that an interest rate hike is going to decrease the lump sum pension plan. Well, that's true for most of what's called District 3, of which South Florida is part of, but in their contract, they have something called a non-decreasing lump sum benefit. So how do those interest rates work? Well, here's how it works. ATT has a formula which will provide you with a monthly pension benefit. Let's assume that that pension benefit was $3,000 a month for the rest of your life. Well, how long is the rest of your life? They use an actuarial table to determine how long the average, I'm going to use, make this up, but 60-year-old will live. Let's say that it's, uh, you know, uh, 20 years to the age of 80. That means 50% of those 60-year-olds will make it to the age of 80 and 60% won't. So AT&T says, okay, we've got to pay $3,000 a month. That's $36,000 a year for the next 20 years. If we put away $720,000, which is $3,000 a month or $36,000 a year times 20 years, we would be golden. Well, yes and no. They do have to put away 720000 to solve the problem to pay that employee, but they're going to earn a rate of interest on that money. The higher the rate of interest they can earn, the fewer dollars they have to put away. The lower the interest rate, the more dollars they have to put away to solve that problem. So the letter that went out said, hey, interest rates are going up. Your lump sum is going to come down because at and doesn't have to put as much money away to solve the problem. Here's the catch to all that. That's all true with the exception of the ATT contract in District 3 because they have a non-decreasing lump sum benefit, which means that that pre-99 lump sum isn't going to go up, but it's not, it's not going to go down. And then for the cash balance part of the plan, that will increase because that is a different interest rate they use to calculate it. But I want everyone that's listening to this that's part of the South Florida District 3 ATT uh, craft pension plan to know you don't have to worry about that letter. The next question I have for you, Mark, is are there any books that you would recommend that I would read for 2023? Absolutely. There is a book that I've listened to the audio version three times now. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, and I believe it was on the New York Times bestseller list. What's great about this book is I was able to listen to it when I'm flying from here to there and I have, you know, three to four hours on a plane. I just put the headset on and listen to it and I listen to chapters over and over again that I really like. And what's great about this book is it's good for people that are in the investment business, but also for the average consumer. And what it does is it talks about things like... uh, When is the best time to invest? Should I be investing in the middle of a recession? How should I invest my money? What happens to people that, you know, try to beat the stock market? It answers a lot of those questions. And I want to just read something in an article that I wrote earlier this year that I uh, I got some great ideas from the psychology of uh, of money. Unfortunately, a lot of investors, not our investors, They try to pick winning stocks by using various strategies of timing the market to avoid downturns. These folks are trying to get the returns without paying the price. These people that I'm talking about, they trade in and out of the market, trying to get out before the market declines and back in before the market heads up. At best, this is really, really tough to do. The money gods do not look kindly The irony of this is that those investors who try to avoid paying the price actually end up paying double. So you can't time the market. It's time in the market, not timing the market that makes all the difference in the world. And perhaps we've done a good job in explaining this to our clients because during the downturns of 2022, and we had plenty of them, we had very few calls from our clientele asking us about what to do next. They know my philosophy, which is stay the course, stay invested, make sure you get your tolerance for risk right, and leave it alone. And like I say, would you rather buy when the market's on sale or fully priced? The best time to get in is when no one else wants to. 
So the next question I have is, what are the contribution limits for 2023 as far as my 401k, 403b, or IRA are concerned? So that's a good question for listeners to uh, pay attention to, those limits, because they increased for 2023 from 2022. IRAs are a great way to save money for the average person out there that does not have a 401k or as part of a pension plan. It's deductible, it accumulates tax deferred, which is a great thing to do. So those limits for 2023 are $6,500 if you're under the age of 50. If you're 50 years of age or older, there's something called a catch-up contribution, which will allow you to put away another $1,000 for a total of $7,500 toward an IRA. A 401k, 403b, or 457, which is a deferred comp plan, will see an increase also for next year. The limit is rising to 22,500 if you're under the age of 50. And if you're 50 years of age or older, there's a catch-up contribution where you can put more away, 7,500 more. So you could put away $30,000 into your 401k. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you're fortunate enough to be in a plan that offers a 401k and a 457, a deferred comp plan, you actually could put $30,000 into the 401k, assuming you're 50 years of age or older, and $30,000 into a 457 plan for a total of $60,000 that you could defer. That saves a lot of income tax, Chris, and adds a lot of money toward your ultimate retirement, which I would highly recommend assuming you can afford to do that. That's great. <clears throat> Next question. I work for the Dade County Public Schools, and I know they don't make a matching contribution to my 401k. Do you still recommend that I make a contribution knowing that they don't match? Yeah, so, you know, the, the question that comes up with a lot of clients that work for municipalities that don't match, why should I contribute if I don't have a match? And my answer to that is don't worry about the match, worry about yourself and getting a tax deductible contribution to ultimately add to your retirement. Because the best dollar you can save is the last dollar that you saved or the next dollar that you're going to save is going to help you ultimately in retirement. So you want to make sure that whether you're getting a match or not, put money away. Now, if you're getting a match, all the better. Because if your company matches a dollar for every dollar you put in and you put away $10,000, even if you earn zero in the market, you've still made 100% on your money because the company is matching 100% of what you put in up to the first, I'm just using an example here, $10,000. So if you put away 10, you're getting the 10 you put in plus the company match of 10. You made 100% on your money even if the market does zero. Does that make some sense to you? That makes perfect sense. Next question. So we are about to start a new year and I want your advice in getting rid of my current credit card debt. Any thoughts on how to do this? I think uh, getting rid of credit card debt is the most important thing that anyone can do, especially people that have it, obviously. And so I would say you've got to get your financial house in order, meet with a certified financial planner, and get the basics done. So what are those basics? One, I'm a firm believer in paying your house off if you can afford to do so. You know that if you have a 30-year mortgage, Chris, and you make one extra payment a year, so rather than making 12 payments, you make yeah, a 13th 13. payment, it takes that mortgage from 30 years down to 21 years. One extra payment will reduce that mortgage by nine years. And so going back to the pecking order, you know, I love the analogy of football for those people that like watching football. You don't tackle from the top, you tackle from the bottom, you get into a firm position and you get your base. Well, you've got to build a financial base to get your financial house in order. And what do I mean by that? The number one thing is getting rid of credit card debt. Well, you got to stop spending money and you don't want to spend money you don't have. Correct. So you get your financial house in order, one, by getting rid of credit card debt, two, by getting three to six times what you spend monthly in a savings account, and three, 
Don't spend more money than you have ever because that's how you get into trouble. Don't bite off more than you can chew. And then you develop an investment game plan where you look at your tolerance for risk and you get the appropriate investments, you know, as far as the risk tolerance, what percent should be in stocks versus bonds so that you're not uncomfortable with the tolerance for risk. Somebody that has a high tolerance is going to be in the ocean with those huge waves, and someone that has a low risk is wants their money under their mattress, so to speak, but somewhere in the middle maybe is where you might fall depending on your tolerance for risk. Mark, let me ask you a question sure. in reference to paying off your house. This is a question, this is a, a conversation that I've had numerous times with uh, bankers and, and, and <clears throat> accountants and whatnot and sometimes they're saying well why would you pay off your house if for instance if you're borrowing money at you know if you're locked in at a three three percent debt rate right why why not keep the money on your side uh, and I, by the way i i am a big believer of why why have any debt you know if, if if you don't need to have it but when 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 somebody makes that statement right it makes sense how, what are your what are your thoughts on that? So that is a very very good question, Fernando. To which there is no right or wrong answer. Uh, you have your own personal philosophy and beliefs, but it's I'm going to answer this a different way. I was sitting with a finance professor from the University of Miami, who's a very very bright person, and he asked that exact same question to me at lunch. He said, "Why would you pay off your house?" when you get a tax deduction um, on interest paid up to, you know, up to a million dollars, assuming you have a mortgage that high, and you could take that money and invest it and have so much more down the road. And I looked at him, and, and I agree with your philosophy. I'm a believer in paying a mortgage off. And I said to him, arithmetically, you're right, but emotionally, you don't know what's going on in my head. And that's where you may not be right, meaning it's not about getting more money. It's about the peace of mind to know that I can come home to this house and I don't know anything on it. Call me old school. Call me old fashioned. Growing up in Canada, mortgages are non-deductible, but I am a big believer in paying off your house. Look, I know this. You can't get into financial trouble if your house is paid off but you might get into financial trouble if it isn't. To piggyback off your, your <coughs> question, I mean, your answer earlier. I that answer, and it, I agree 100%. Again, that's just my personal philosophy. That doesn't mean that I'm right, but it's what I believe in. There is no price in a piece of mind. No, I, I agreed. To piggyback on your answer about the credit card debt and paying off your house, how, how do you feel if let's say someone doesn't have that full payment to make towards a mortgage. However, they do add money towards the principal each each month, whether it's 100, 200, 300 bucks. Um, do you feel that that is a good plan for long term or should they be using that money to take out uh, their credit card debt? I think what you're really saying is should the excess money, if they have any, uh, go to reducing the mortgage or paying off the credit card debt. I think maybe that's the Correct. the question. And so my answer to that would be credit card debt first. Look, you can't eat an elephant all in one bite. It's a little bit at a time. They're, they're, they're big animals. And so the credit card debt you need to get rid of first because, and I would look at where the highest interest, interest rates rate. are first and then reduce from there. Uh, but you got to get rid of that credit card debt. Once you get rid of that, then with any excess money, I'd put part of it into savings, which if that's indeed what you want to do, which, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan of. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Mark. My next question. I have heard a lot of talk of only investing with the fiduciary. What exactly is a fiduciary, and can you explain this to me? Sure. So a fiduciary, which, which I am, is an individual that's in the investment business, which is held to a higher standard than someone who's a non-fiduciary. A fiduciary, by the code of ethics and what they sign, must do 
to what's in your best interest, not in their best interest. So people that work for uh, one company, and I'm not saying that they're not fiduciaries, and they only have one product to sell, are they might have a harder time being a fiduciary than someone versus someone that's independent that has you know every financial vehicle available to them. And so a fiduciary, uh, like I am required, not only am I a fiduciary, but I must sign paperwork after every transaction we make that holds me to a higher uh, discipline to make sure we're doing the right thing for uh, you know for the for the public. Someone that is in sales that is thinking about themselves and how much money they are going to make generally is not a fiduciary and not doing what's to the best interest of the individual. Somebody that's recommending something to, let's say, yourself without asking you your needs and, and kind of where you're at and looking at you through your eyes, not through their own eyes, uh, that person would not be a fiduciary, but someone who's looking at you through your eyes would be considered a fiduciary in doing the best and right thing for you. And I hope that answers that that question. Yes, definitely. I appreciate that. I hope that explanation, I should say, of what a fiduciary is, is, is uh, understandable. Definitely. <clears throat> Next question. <clears throat> I am somewhat confused about when I need to t- take a required minimum distribution. I was told that I might incur a 50% penalty on what I should have taken, but didn't. Can you explain this, please? Sure, yeah. The, the laws changed with the SECURE Act. And the old required minimum distribution was when you were 70 and a half years of age and you could actually delay it till April 1st of the year following. The new law that took effect requires you to take a distribution in the year in which you turn age 72. So it's not... The halfway point in the year, it's when you're 72. So if you turn 72 January 1st this year, your first distribution is due December 31st of this year, but you can wait until April 1st of 2023 because the IRS extends a 90-day grace period. So technically, the first distribution is due April 1st of 2023. Now, what's it based on? It's based on the December 31 bounce of 2022. So you always look at the previous year, all of your IRAs, not one, and you use a factor based on your age 72, December 31st this year, to divide by that previous December 31 bounce of all of your IRAs to determine what needs to be pulled out. It's roughly 3.9% of the December 31 bounce of the previous year. Interestingly enough, Most people are upset this year. Why? Because their portfolios are down and a lot of calls we get saying, well, I guess I won't have to take as much out of my IRA this year for those who have to take the required distribution. And the answer is, well, it's not based on where the value is this year. It's based on where it was last year. Now, to your question, if you don't take that distribution out and you forget about it or you don't know what you're doing, there's a 50% tax, penalty tax from the IRS on what you should have taken out but didn't, in addition to also being required to pull it out. So it's a very onerous tax. Here's the other thing. Let's say uh, that you were holding, Chris, uh, seven different IRAs, and they were with different you know, institutions you're going to need to add up all of those IRAs. And as long as the distribution, it can come from all seven, but as long as what's required, taking into, all, taking into account all seven, comes from any one, if not all of those IRAs, the IRS doesn't care which one it comes from as long as you take it out and meet the law. Wow. Now, here's another interesting question. What- You're the beneficiary of one of those IRAs. Let's say it's your father, and he's age 72 and dies that year. Well, if he hadn't taken that distribution, you are required to take the distribution. And by the way, those taxes are paid by you because you're required to take what your father didn't take but should have taken uh, in in the form of a distribution. So you're going to end up paying tax on that. Now, the laws changed 
with respect to inheriting an IRA. Let's go back to the example of death again. So let's assume that your father uh, is, is married to your mom and they're happily married and everything else and your mother's living, your father passed away. Your mother can take over that IRA. It's called an inherited IRA. She can put it in her own name and she can take it out as she sees fit, depending on her age, over her life expectancy, et cetera. It's a different story with respect to you, uh, Christopher, because if your mom and dad both passed and now they're leaving that IRA to you and you inherited it, you used to be able to stretch it over your life expectancy. Now, there's no required distribution when you inherit it, but you must (laughs) clean it out 10 years after the death of your parents, because I'm assuming they both went down together in this example. So you can do nothing for 10 years, but at the end of 10 years, the IRS wants to get paid. So they're going to require you to take it all out. That's the way the law works. The Florida retirement system is probably one of the most complicated retirement systems out there. And unfortunately, most people that are work for the state of Florida do not understand the system other than drop because all they hear about is, oh, I got to go into drop, got to drop. And drop's not a bad thing, but what I say to people is understand what benefits you have and what your options are, and most people don't understand it. So if you work for the state of Florida, by law, you're, you're part of their pension plan. And that pension plan, I'm just going to give you a simple example is based on your years of service. So assuming you were not high risk, uh, normal retirement is 30 years of service or age 62 with six years of service. You're what's called fully vested, which means you're entitled to all of your benefits. So as an example, they would take, uh, let's say somebody had 30 years of service. They multiply that by 1.6. That's a factor they use, which is 48% of the average of your five highest years of salary. So if somebody were making, and I'm going to be generous here, $100,000 a year, they would be eligible for 40% of that, call it 50% to round it off, or $50,000 a year. The question is, for how long? The answer is forever, as long as they live. Now, that's called an option one benefit. Option two is a slight reduction, but it's guaranteed to make a payment to you forever And if you pass the first year you retire, then to one of your beneficiaries for at least nine years, that's why it's called life in 10 years certain. Option three is what I call a spousal benefit, which pays both you and your spouse forever. So it's going to be, depending on your spouse's age, a reduced benefit because now they have to pay on two lives instead of one. And option four is an aberration of option uh, three. Um... The other thing you can do is say, you know what? I don't want to go in. I don't want to take a monthly pension benefit. I want to convert it to a lump sum. That is called the second election or the investment plan. So you can take that monthly pension benefit and flip it over to a lump sum benefit. And I can tell you that someone that's earning about 70000 a year that has 30 years of service in his, a- in his age, let's say 60, that lump sum is going to be somewhere around a half a million dollars. So rather than taking a monthly pension benefit, they're going to say, you know, I'd rather walk away with a lump sum, invest it, and live on that and leave that to whomever I want to when I pass. The other option you have is DROP, Deferred Retirement Option Program. Now, you can't get into that unless you are age 62 with six years or you have 30 years of service. There's certain... uh, departments that can delay the 30 years of service. You you, you basically have to get in by age 57 if you have 30 years of service prior to that, but school teachers can delay that. And so, excuse me, drop is not a bad benefit because it's giving you the best of both worlds. When you go into drop, you're considered to be retired. Okay. And you have to select one of those four options that I just mentioned when you go into drop and then What you should have received in a monthly pension benefit is funding drop for the five years you're in it. And when you get out of drop, what was funding drop is now paid to you and you walk away with a large drop benefit. It is a very confusing 
time for most people as they go in it, because they have a lot of decisions to make. Do I take option one, two, three, or four? Do I go into drop? Do I go into second election? Do I delay it? When do I go in? So there's a lot of decisions to be made, and you really must meet with someone that understands this system, in my opinion, to get it right, because you don't want to make a mistake. The number one mistake that I think people make is agreeing to go into drop and getting out too early. If I were advising someone, and there's, again, nothing wrong with drop, stay there the full five years to collect the full benefit. Is uh, single, and they're getting uh, ready to go in to retirement, either take drop or so on and so forth, and they have a child, what would be your recommendation for them? Well, so that's an interesting question also. What happens if you work for the state of Florida, you're divorced, as you said, single, and you have a child, and that child is under the age of 25. Most people don't know what benefit that child would receive. Here's the answer. That child, assuming they're under the age of 25 under state of Florida law, receives an option three benefit until they're 25 years of age, and then that stops, and the money that was being paid to that child stays with the state of Florida. So best to consider maybe buying some life insurance for the protection for that child because the state of Florida is going to end up with that money. Now, if you are married and your kids are over the age of 25 and you both go down in a car wreck, nothing goes to the children. It all stays with the state of Florida. Unless you're in the investment plan, second election, same thing, and then that money would go to whomever you name as a beneficiary. Perfect. Appreciate that. Can I just add a question? Sure. 529 versus... Uh, your typical Florida prepaid. Florida prepaid. Yeah, so the question is, what's the difference between the 529 plan and the Florida prepaid? The Florida prepaid was obviously developed by the state of Florida, as a lot of states have a plan, to try to cushion the blow of the high inflation cost for going to college, obviously for kids. So they developed a Florida prepaid plan, which I did for my daughter way back when. And it was a great plan uh, it had to be a, a Florida-sponsored uh, school that was part of the uh, uh, that you know system, and it paid essentially for four years of college. You could buy dorm uh, credits, etc. That cost has gone up precipitously over the years as inflation has gone up. But the whole premise bef behind that was to offset the cost of inflation down the road, which is still a great plan, by the way. The 529 plan is a national plan in the United States. It allows you to put money away non-deductibly, but it accumulates tax-free. And the money comes out of the plan tax-free to send your child to any college you want within the United mm -hmm. States. The 529 plan is a great plan, in my opinion, uh, for anyone that thinks that their child may go to other than a Assuming, you know, because we live in the state of Florida, other than a Florida school and wants to go elsewhere. And so that money in the 529 plan is invested in a fund. There's certain fund families that that invest the money in such a way that as the child gets closer to school, it decreases the risk of the investment. So the funds are there to send that child to school. But the, the significance of it is the money will really grow over the years. And we do and recommend a lot of 529 plans to our clients in addition to the Florida prepaid. Now, what's nice about the 529 plan, the government it really wants kids to go to college. And so if you have one child that you did a plan on that doesn't go, but another one does, you can move the money over to that other child, which they will allow you to do. And it doesn't necessarily have to be for the one child that you set the plan up for, which is kind of a, an interesting way of solving the problem. Both are good. My advice is don't talk about it. Do it. That's awesome. Last question I have for you. I looked at your website and noticed that you made it to the Forbes list of top financial security professionals. Congratulations on that. How did this come about? Well, that. <laughs> thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, we were contacted, I guess, a few years ago by Forbes. And I don't know how they got my name, but they did. And they sent me um, uh, a questionnaire, which was about a 15-page questionnaire that we had to fill out. This was in uh, March, I believe. 
And I filled it all out. And on October, I got a, a, a congratulatory uh, letter from Forbes saying, hey, you've made it to the top uh, 500, I think it was five, or actually we're in the top 250 advisors within the United States. We then, this year, made it to the top 125. Uh, actually, we're uh, eighth, I believe, in the state of Florida, and again, in, in the United States, in the top 250. So that was a very nice honor that we had received. Look, I will tell you, uh, it, it's all about making sure you do the right thing for a client. It's about taking the client's needs into account. It's about asking the questions of the client to make sure you're doing the right thing for them. If you're doing the right thing for a client and you're always telling the truth, you never have to worry about anything else. And I would advise anyone that's working with a financial advisor, if your gut tells you that's the right person, then stay with that person.